So now let's review some common CT techniques and discuss how these techniques can be manipulated to help you identify abnormalities. Radiation is um, administered during a CT scan, and it varies depending on the type of machine that's used, the type of scan that's being performed, and the patient's body size. So sometimes some of the older machines actually administer more radiation than some of the newer machines do. Head CT scans, for example, will have less radiation than an abdominal CT scan just because the area that's being scanned is smaller in size. Patients' body habitus can also change the amount of radiation that's administered. So patients that are larger in size need more radiation to penetrate the body size and the body tissue. It's important to remember, though, that radiation is additive, so multiple scans really should be limited whenever possible. You really want to limit your overall lifetime dose of radiation. So let's review Hounsfeld units before we move on. A Hounsfeld unit is a measure of the density of a structure. And density is the amount of radiation that that structure absorbs. So air has the lowest Hounsfeld units. It measures about negative 1,000 Hounsfeld units. It then progresses on to fat, which measures about negative 50 to negative 100, water, which is about zero, soft tissue, which ranges from about 20 to 300, and then bone, which is the highest Hounsfeld units, and it measures greater than about 700. If you put metal in there, which is not really an anatomic, anatomical structure, metal will actually be the most Hounsfeld units, close to about 1,000. So what are window levels? Window levels are digital manipulation of the image that help you accentuate structures of various different Hounsfeld units. Window levels can actually be changed by the radiologist as a post-processing mechanism after the CT scan is obtained. So the CT scan is obtained only in one type of window, and then everything else can be done afterwards. So this is an example of three different types of window levels. On the left, we have lung windows. It creates a very white appearance, so if you're actually looking at the lungs, then the lungs would be best seen on these windows. However, these are also very useful in evaluating for free air. The middle is the soft tissue window, which is the window that's used most commonly to take a look at the solid organs of the abdomen. And the right is a bony window, and that's used to take a look at the bony structures. So whenever I take a look at a CT scan, I scroll back and forth using each of these windows because each window shows me something different within the, within the abdomen. What are some different acquisition variables? So we can use intravenous contrast, we can use oral contrast, and we can perform the CT scan at different time delays after intravenous contrast administration. So let's take a look at when each of these would be useful. Intravenous contrast is a low osmolar, non-ionic, iodinated solution. It actually opacifies structures based on the amount of blood flow within that structure. So structures that have more blood flow will be more opacified than structures that don't have blood flow. This is excreted by the kidneys, and it can have side effects. So it can cause acute tubular necrosis in patients that have underlying renal failure. So if a patient has a GFR of less than 30 or a creatinine of greater than about 1.5, Intravenous contrast is contraindicated because it can cause acute tubular necrosis that may or may not be reversible. Occasionally, it can cause hives and itching, and very rarely, it can cause cardiopulmonary collapse. So because of this, all radiology centers should be equipped with crash equipment and should be staffed by a physician who's trained in running a code. It's actually normal for patients to have a feeling of warmth during contrast administration. So when patients complain of this, it really should not be confused for a contrast reaction. Oral contrast is dilute barium sulfate, and that's the one that's most commonly used. However, gastrographin, which is a water-soluble type of contrast, can also be used if there's suspicion of a bowel perforation. And that's because if gastrographin penetrates into the peritoneum, it can be absorbed, and dilute barium sulfate does not. We use approximately 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters of oral contrast, and this is usually administered about one and a half to two hours prior to CT scanning. Oral contrast is not absorbed and it does not affect the kidneys. So if a patient has a contrast allergy, it's still safe to administer oral contrast. So intravenous contrast is useful almost always when performing an abdominal CT. The only exception to this is when it's being performed to detect renal calculi. And we'll take a look at an example of this. Oral contrast is useful whenever you're trying to determine any kind of bowel pathology, any kind of intra-abdominal abscess, and in most instances of non-traumatic pain. Again, the only exception is when you're trying to detect renal calculi. <laughs>